It's the promise of one plant and 500 jobs, but it may be just the first glimpse of the hydrogen future. And it's 548 days away, and yet we seem to be on a collision course with a presidential election that most people don't want. Today is Sunday, May 7th, 2023, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. A very timely piece of news arrived this past week as we watched Detroit and the auto industry realigning itself for the future. Last week on this program, I asked Bill Ford Jr. if something on the horizon might disrupt our move to electrification, and I asked in particular about hydrogen. Well, almost on cue this past week, a Norwegian company, Nell, announced its plans to build a manufacturing plant in Michigan. It will be one of the largest electrolyzer plants in the world. An electrolyzer takes water and breaks it down into its two components, oxygen and hydrogen. And that hydrogen can then be turned into energy, dense, clean energy. A hydrogen powered vehicle works kind of like a magic trick. You burn hydrogen and the emission you get is water vapor. It just so happens hydrogen is also the most abundant element in the universe. But last week, Bill Ford ran down some of the many obstacles. Well, just what is the promise of hydrogen and what does it mean that Nell chose Michigan for its plant? Coming up, we'll talk with the CEO of Nell about those questions and more. Also, I always note that elections are a marathon and not a sprint. Maybe not a great idea to start prognosticating 548 days out, but more and more it seems we're headed to Biden Trump too, which no one seems to want. How can that be? And ML Elric of the Detroit Free Press will be here to make a plea for a little space. It's all today on Flashpoint. Well, this week, Governor Whitmer was in Washington with the Commerce Secretary and the CEO of Nell Hydrogen of Norway to announce a new manufacturing plant coming to the mitten. It's a $350 million plant that went up and running, will be one of the largest of its kind in the world, making electrolyzers capable of churning out four gigawatts of hydrogen power a year. I'm very happy to have with me the CEO of Nell, uh, Håkon Valdahl. Uh, Mr. Valdahl, very good to have you with me. Thank you for your time. Uh, before we get to the disruptive possibility Abilities of hydrogen. L let me let you start with uh, why Michigan? How did uh, Michigan rise to the top? I am. Um, I think um, if you look at an electrolyzer, it's uh, it's a big piece of equipment, and it doesn't make sense to ship thousands of tons across the Atlantic Ocean from our current manufacturing facility in um, in Europe. So we wanted to establish uh, manufacturing plant in in the U.S. driven by IRA and the positive sentiment around the hydrogen at the moment. We ran a big contest among many states, and Michigan came up with the um, best total package based on financial incentives, access to a skilled workforce, you know, proximity to our partner General Motors. So it was the, it was the complete package that made us uh, go from Michigan. You have not yet uh, determined exactly where in Michigan it'll be, though we assume it'll be in the Detroit area. You do want to be close to GM. What will be the deciding factor on that? Um, I think it will be, as you said, in the Detroit area. We are looking into different um, side options now, and, uh, you know, Greenfield versus Brownfield. Um, but I, I think, you know, once in Michigan and also in the Detroit area, we, we have the luxury of choosing between many potential good sites. I don't think that will be a, be a problem. Now, obviously, uh, this is going to feel like a layup question because I'm talking to someone who is obviously very invested in the future of hydrogen. But if you could, uh, while we are all, I, I, it was about 15 years ago, I rode in a hydrogen-powered Mercedes uh, at a symposium in Shanghai, and I thought I was looking at some kind of magic trick, the way that hydrogen power works. But for a lot of reasons, obviously, it, it, it has not been chosen as the fuel of the future. Tell me a little bit about your bullishness about why you believe we can get to a hydrogen future. Well, first of all, mobility is, is just one of, um, you know, many applications for hydrogen. Sure. I, I, you know, right now we're looking at hydrogen being, you know, needed to, to produce fertilizers, to, to make green steel, to make, uh, you know, uh, petrochemicals, uh, etc. And, and if you look at mobility, then it's it's one of those potential applications. I, I'm not a fundamentalist. I'm not saying that hydrogen is the right 
you know, fuel for uh, for all um, types of vehicles. I think battery electric vehicles make make makes a lot of sense. But for heavy duty vehicles, hydrogen definitely has some you know attractive characteristics. And if we can get the cost down, then you know hydrogen will be cost competitive versus um, fossil fuels. And that's part of what Nell is doing now. We're scaling up manufacturing to get the cost down and make hydrogen more cost competitive. Uh, in fact, just last week, as I mentioned, Bill Ford Jr. was on the program talking about, you know, it's cumbersome to move around. It's a really tricky uh, substance uh, to sort of rely on at the moment. Um, but let me let you handle one of the criticisms that I know you hear all the time, that it is not as green as it sounds because it turns out it takes an awful lot of, uh, right now, fossil fuels to create usable hydrogen. I think that is part of what we want to want to change with an electrolyzer connect, connected to um, a wind farm or a solar farm where you where you actually use renewable energy to produce hydrogen. It is indeed green and, and you know, the carbon footprint is, is limited. If you connect it to a grid uh, which is running on coal, it's not green at all. Uh, so so we, we support green hydrogen uh, based on renewable energy and then you know the, the environmental footprint is, is limited. Uh, we think of the Scandinavian nations as being uh, among the greenest uh, places, uh, most green-minded uh, places on earth. What, what are the, what's the outlook for hydrogen there as opposed to what you hear from the rest of the world? I think we have uh, you know the similar challenges as, as the rest of the world in Scandinavia. Um, if you look at the light duty vehicle market uh, and, and Norway as one example, I think nine out of 10 cars sold are battery electric vehicles. Yeah. So clearly Norwegians have adopted, you know, uh, electric cars. Uh, but we have a challenge when it comes to the heavy duty segment. We, we need to find a way to, you know, provide clean and, and renewable and cost competitive fuels for the future, for truck drivers, for buses, et cetera. And there I think hydrogen will, will play an important role and we have projects looking into establishing, you know, um, and, uh, fueling infrastructure for, for truck drivers. But it's, you know, it's, it's uh, the chicken and the egg. Uh, nobody wants to buy a hydrogen uh, truck <laughs> unless they can fuel it reliably. And, and, and few people want to operate the fueling station unless they have customers. So, it, you know, it takes a little bit of time to, to get that up and running. Uh, we, we, in fact, we've, we've watched this exact thing. Same thing happened with people with their uh, range uh, yeah, anxiety over electrics. I mean, you, it, yeah, you're going to go through the exact same thing. But can you see um, uh, uh, hydrogen becoming uh, a counterpart uh, to, to the way that, I mean, mobility is obviously in Michigan uh, our, our big focus on, on, on the future and how Michigan can remain the mobility capital of the world. How does hydrogen, do you see, fit into that uh, in, the, in the near future? Well, if, if you ask me flat out, I think um, hydrogen has uh, its most powerful application, as I said, in the heavy duty segment. Yeah. Um, and, and then we're talking about, uh, you know, fulfillment centers, you know, the big retailers, the, um, uh, the, the FedExes, the UPSs of the world, you know, the companies that have hundreds of, uh, of trucks that they need to send out uh, with goods, and uh, then they want the trucks to come back. They want to refill them and send them out again. They want the short turnaround time. There, I think, hydrogen has uh, you know very important role to play, and and maybe it will also play a role in the light duty vehicle market. But I'm, as I said, I'm not a fundamentalist. I think the world needs more than just hydrogen. Um, sure. I'm, I'm not against battery electric vehicles. I, I think we need a mix of, of solutions in the same way that, you know, you and I just, we, we don't want just one type of vehicle. We don't want just the SUV or the sedan or the saloon. We want we want plenty of options. Yeah. And I think that's so true for the, the energy that powers the vehicles. Uh, I, I remember it being explained to me when I first was in that hydrogen vehicle those many years ago that hydrogen power is so dense that rather than me plugging my car into my house, I might plug my house into my car. Can you see uh, a day coming where uh, people are driving electric vehicles as their personal cars? I mean, I'm sorry, hydrogen vehicles as their personal cars. Is that a possibility at all? Absolutely. Um, but then again, it's, it's hard to extrapolate on a, on a global basis. If sure. you look at uh, North America, if you look at Detroit, if you look at Europe, you know, plenty of us have 
private garages. We can we can you know have an adapter. We can charge our our vehicles. But that is a luxury in in many parts of the world. Uh, if you go to Tokyo, if you go to Seoul in Korea, you know cities with with ten, fifteen, twenty million people, they they don't have private you know parking spaces. They don't they're yeah. not able to charge their vehicles, and, <laughs> and and the grid is not capable of delivering all that electricity. By the way, when we all want to supercharge our vehicles at the exact same point in time, right? And there, I think hydrogen offers some you know interesting uh, features. Again. Um, I don't think it's either or. I think it's it's a combination. Yeah. Uh, in some parts of the world, hydrogen will be the preferred choice. In other parts of the world, electricity will be the preferred choice for, you know, your personal vehicle. Well, you've given the state a big uh, a big lift in making it a part of that hydrogen future, or whatever it's going to be. We are eager to watch. Hogan Valdahl, thank you so much for your time. Really good to have you on the program. Thanks for having me. You bet. When we come back, we'll talk about the presidential race that seems to be shaking up that most Americans don't really want. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. It was nice to be able to call and get quick response. As it benefited to me and my family, I recommend to everyone, it's available 24-7. They really do care about your well-being. It just got a whole lot cooler at Gardner White because the all-new Tempur-Pedic Breeze is here and it's 10 degrees cooler with the advanced and innovative Pure Cool Comfort technology. You can sleep on it tonight because every Tempur-Pedic is guaranteed in stock with free same-day delivery. And get the Gardner White exclusive 0% financing for 88 months and get the lowest payment period at a dollar a day. Get it today at the Memorial Day mattress sale. Gardner White, your elite Tempur-Pedic dealer. Whoa, DraftKings, look at all these blackjack games. You got Spanish 21, vacation blackjack, touchdown blackjack. What is this? Some big old Vegas buffet where you're putting the waffles next to the crab legs, deciding what dessert you want for breakfast? Well, guess what? Smack me in the mouth with all of it. I want it all. Download the DraftKings Casino app, the home of blackjack, and take advantage of this great offer. Action's so good, why play anywhere else? Somebody bring me the cream puffs. I love that healthcare is at my fingertips at any time. I don't have to take time off from school. I recommend to everyone. As a student of WCCCD, this is a great benefit to have. It works on your schedule. In order to deal with the problems of today, we must be more innovative. There's obviously better solutions out there that we need to start exploring. Rents are going up and up and up and up. A great Florida reef is under attack. When great value is out, it's a problem. Solutionaries, the creative thinkers and doers working to make the world a better place. Subscribe at youtube.com slash solutionaries. Welcome back. We are a long way away from the presidential election of 2024, and yet we already seem to be on this course of a race that polls show us nobody really wants a rematch of Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Let me talk about that with uh, two of the guys that I like to turn to for political thoughts. Uh, Adolph Mongo with Adolph Mongo Associates, political consultant, and Dennis Darnoy with Densar Consulting. Guys, thanks very much for the time. Uh, Dennis, let me start with you. Is this, is this it? Are, are we really just going to head this way for now oh, about a year and a half, even though it's not what folks really want? I think barring, uh, you know, something phenomenal occurring, we're going to see a rematch of, of 2020. Um, and I think right now maybe it's an interesting question as who becomes the vice presidential nominee for, for Donald Trump. But the states that determine the races in 2020 are going to be the states that, uh, you know, make the race in 2024. Um, there may be an addition uh, in terms of a third party candidate, but in terms of the major party candidates, I think right now you're looking at a rerun of 2020. Wow. Um, Adolf, your thoughts. I, I, there are an awful lot of Democrats who I think quietly would love for Joe Biden to be a one term president, step aside, let's, but nobody's going to say that publicly at this point, obviously. Um, but is this the race that we're going to have? Yeah, it is. You know what? There's a lot of folks. I said it. I call him grandpa, but I love my grandpa. <laughs> Listen, I love my grandpa, 
you know, you got to take the keys from grandpa. But this is who we got. It's good versus evil. That's how I look at it. And Democrats don't have anybody else. They got they got Joe Biden. And un unfortunately uh, for the Republicans, they're going to have to they're going to have to deal with uh, with Donald Trump. He's not going away. He's he's a, he, he just <laughs> not going away. Uh, well, I guess I, I guess some would say that about Joe Biden, too. Uh, Dennis, you were telling me earlier that uh, that this is a different race, though, because both men now, though, will be running on records, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, when Donald Trump ran in 2016, he didn't have a record, and he was able to say, this is, you know, Hillary Clinton versus me, and this is what I'm going to do as your president. Um, Joe Biden, you know, now has four years of a record, and you can do a comparison where, where you can say, look at what happened economically under President Trump. How was your 401k? What was the standing of America, uh, you know, internationally? Um, and now you can compare that to how Bi Biden's run the White House. And I think the Trump team is going to make that argument and say, you know, going back to the Ronald Reagan line of, you know, were you better off four years ago? And you're going to find people, you know, who may not appreciate or, or like a lot of the things that Donald Trump says or does look at their own personal finances and make a political decision based upon where they are economically. Uh, well, Donald, go ahead. Donald Trump has... Uh, he wanted to overthrow the government. Donald Trump has been indicted. Donald Trump is a ra is, is 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 he he's a rapist. That's according to uh, this case he got. So Donald Trump got a well, whole lot of baggage. But, but and, Adolf, Adolf, and, and, all of those things, Adolf, though, have only made him stronger with his base supporters. But he's not gonna win. You know what? If it was anybody else. But Donald Trump, when I say Joe Biden is in trouble, but if it's Donald Trump, Joe Biden is going to beat him. Interesting. Uh, let, let me, I want us to also include, uh, talk about the Senate race. Dennis, it's really interesting. Nolan Fenley wrote a piece recently that uh, right now, uh, Alyssa Slotkin uh, is, uh, she's got, a few, there's a few other Democrats running, but she's obviously become uh, all of those people that we thought might run for that race, one by one, uh, declined. She seems to be, she's clearly the front runner. She's going to raise a lot of money. And the GOP right now, I don't hear any names yet. Yes, uh, and that's true. But I would say this, that, again, there are going to be eight Senate races coming up in the 2024 election, which will determine control of the Senate. With the exception of West Virginia, Republicans across the other seven states, of which Michigan's included, they don't have uh, a filled out field yet. So I don't feel like the Michigan Republicans are that far behind. The, the fact of the matter is whoever the nominee is going to be, he or she has to recognize how much money they're going to have to raise. Um, we've talked about this before. The Michigan Republican Party as a structure is, is bankrupt in every sense of the word. It's a house built on sand. So whoever the candidate is, is going to have to be very self-sufficient. And I think, uh, you know, whether that's a self-funder, um, you yeah. know, whether it's someone who, you know, has run for office and has name recognition, uh, you know, we will see a candidate. It will be a race. Um, it may not be a top tier race in terms of how national Republicans view it, but it is certainly going to be one of the eight Senate races to watch across the, the country. Uh, Adolph, uh, Michael Griffey, who ran... There is a person that I've been hearing the Republicans do have a guy that that has money and he wants to get in there. So I think is listen, if he gets in there, he's gonna make it a race. But they won't but he has he won't announce until uh July. Until later. Uh Adolf, uh, Michael Griffey, who ran for that congressional seat in Detroit the last time around, wrote a, a column recently that Alyssa Slotkin um hasn't done enough to work uh for for the African American vote and that um that maybe it's a little too early to just hand her a nomination. Well, you know what? Listen, I th just thought that uh, Garland Gilchrist wanted to uh, run for the Senate. Yeah. But, you know, stabbing on them, they did what they needed to do. And, right. And nobody in, in Detroit likes uh, slocking, but she is who she is. So 
this is what we got to deal with. All right, guys, thanks so much for the thought. This is what we got to deal with. This kind of sounds like the headline for these races. Uh, thank you both so much. We'll have you again, I know, back on a, on a future broadcast really soon. Back with more, uh, ML Elric will join me with a plea. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. The funny thing about change is, it's never around when you want it. And you really want it when you have an instant game from the Michigan Lottery. I'm for luck. I'm for luck. With so many to choose from and millions in cash prizes, a little play can make your day. Play large, win large. The new instant games with top prizes up to $2 million and over $179 million in total prizes. Start your spring cleaning with Perfect Power Wash, your number one choice for professional power washing. Dirt, mold, and algae accumulate on your home and lead to costly damage. Perfect Power Wash's safe process and professional technicians remove these harmful contaminants to keep your house, roof, and concrete looking beautiful and protected. This spring, bring out the best in your home by calling the pros at Perfect Power Wash. Use promo code TV to save 10% on all services. It could happen out of nowhere to anyone in an instant, changing your life, falling. I have this image stuck in my head of me flying forward like Superman. From your balance to hazards in your home, Dr. McGeorge with the steps you can take to minimize your chance of injury. Balancing Act, Monday starting at 4 on Local 4 News and streaming on Local 4 Plus. Welcome back. Perhaps you read last Sunday's Detroit Free Press column by the one and only M.L. Elric, in which he was making a plea for press space at City Hall. M.L., uh, uh, well, first off, I'm really, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Really curious about the traction you've received since then uh, and what you heard from people about, is this much ado about nothing? Obviously, you and I don't think so, but right. we're kind of invested. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the traction I've received is the same traction I had on my 78 Pontiac when I was trying to go uphill in the snow. <laughs> okay. We've kind of slid sideways and we may be going downhill. Mm. Uh, the building authority says they have no new position, which was basically you pay the rent in the basement or you beat it. Uh, and it is the free press decision that we don't want to be in the basement anymore. Yep, you right. know, uh, we are trying to save some money, but truly the real issue here is when you're a watchdog, you need to be on the front step. When you're in the basement, you're an incontinent dog. And we have enough incontinent dogs in Detroit. We need more watchdogs. In a city and state that we, as we've talked about ad nauseum on this program, is considered the worst when it comes to ethics and transparency. Yeah. We, we, I mean, we have two former speakers of the Michigan House, one who's admitted to public corruption, the other one who's being investigated mm -hmm. for it. We've had half a dozen city council members uh, either be indicted or admit to wrongdoing and go to prison. We've had a mayor who was sent to prison who just got released from prison. You know, if ever there was a city, if ever there was a state where you need the fourth estate keeping an eye on things, where you need reporters to be where the public can't go to see what the people deserve to see, it's here and it's now. And the basement, we not only are we 11 floors below the mayor's office, we're 12 floors because we're actually underground. It's like we're buried. And, and you, in your column, talked about what proximity has meant just to you over those years and the conversations you had when, when you were uh, up and about either around the council or the mayor's office. Absolutely. You know, working after hours, I saw that the mayor was redecorating his office, Mayor Kilpatrick, at the same time he was cutting city services. Now, if I don't see the carpet guys going in after hours, we don't know about that. But when we see things like that, then we can say, oh, who's paying for that? How much does it cost? Why are we doing it? Is it your buddy who's got the contract or was it bid out? And we can start to provide people not only an idea of how their dollars are being spent, but just what the rhythm of government is. Because when the mayor decides to announce that something big is going on, if you're on the mayor's floor, you know it when everybody comes running to see him. And every place I've worked, we've had access to the executive. In New Hampshire, we could ask the governor a question when he left mm -hmm. for the day. Mm -hmm. In City Hall, whether Kilpatrick liked you or not, if he was on the elevator, he would answer a question. 
and everybody in city government talks about transparency. This is a chance to show us it's not just talk. You're willing to step up and say, we have nothing to hide. If you are watching us every day, you will see nothing that would trouble the people. I love to hear people say that. Now I want to see them prove it. But you can see why some elected officials would just as soon have you in the basement. Uh, yeah, not just me, right? but other Convenient. reporters. Yeah, sure. sure. Well, I mean, listen. And um, others would say, look, you, you, wanna, you want space up on the 11th floor? It's, it, uh, that's pretty hefty real estate. Pay for it. I'll tell you what. If they give us a quote to get back on 11, I'll get back to them. But right now, if we do that, if the free press decides to sign a lease on the 11th floor, that's just space for the free press. It's not for all the media. Yeah, fair. This yes. is for every reporter in town. Right. This is for every photographer in town to work from. This is a place where every journalist whose job is to inform the people about what their government is doing will have a place to work. Clean, convenient, and sensible. When you're in the basement, you don't see anything. You also outlined an a interesting problem. I only got about a minute left, but this interesting phenomenon we have with an awful lot of family members are back on the, on the payroll getting jobs again. And we had a family and friends plan with Kwame Kilpatrick, and it yeah. hasn't exactly gone away. No, well, we changed the charter in Detroit so that wouldn't happen again. And guess what? Not only is it happening again, but the charter says it's okay. You can hire whoever the hell you want. You just got to tell us you're doing it. And even then, people aren't following the rules. So how much have things changed? You need us on that wall. <laughs> did we catch to that? Paraphrase. Did we catch that part of the charter as it was going through? Because maybe we were, maybe we missed a, a, a paragraph there. When you're in right? the basement, you miss a well, lot, Devin. When you're in the basement. Okay, if you agree with ML uh, and you're a Detroit resident, contact your city council representative. Let them know how you feel about it. ML, thanks as always. Thank and you. I'm on your side. That's going to do it for us. Uh, Flashpoint's always on your side. Meet the Press coming up next, but we hope to we'll see you next time right back here. Flashpoint.